Hi, welcome to GardenWise, the place everybody comes to learn about sustainable landscaping. I'm your host, Billy Goodnick, local landscape architect. Got a lot to cover in this episode, including Kathy Pere with some tips about drip irrigation. Uh, I'll be telling you about ways to create alternatives to a front lawn and also ways to put pockets of color in your garden so that it looks great all year round. But first, we're going to hear from Santa Barbara County Water Manager, Matt Young. Take it away, Matt. We have a diverse portfolio of supply here in Santa Barbara County, and the percentage of each supply varies quite a bit based on where you live and who's providing you water, and also year to year, depending on what's available. So the biggest and most important source of supply countywide is groundwater. It's heavily relied on by agriculture and North County uh, in particular, but also here on the South Coast, uh, it is a, it's an important part of the water supply portfolio. Next up would be surface water. Everybody knows Lake Kachuma and the San Inez Valley. Uh, that provides water both to the San Inez Valley and to the South Coast. Uh, but also in uh, northern Santa Barbara County, we have Twitchell Reservoir, which is a surface water reservoir, but is used to recharge the Santa Maria groundwater basin and provide water for both urban and agricultural uses. In addition to surface water and groundwater, we also have state water, which is imported from northern California. It comes in via a series of aqueducts and pipelines and pump stations and is delivered to various entities throughout Santa Barbara County, uh, including here to the south coast where it's delivered to Lake Kachuma and then brought through the tunnel Lake Kachuma water here to, to local purveyors. Finally, there's recycled water. Certain water purveyors throughout the county have invested in recycling water uh, and using it for either injection into groundwater basins or for uh, non-potable uses like irrigating golf courses in universities. During these times when reservoirs are full, many purveyors will choose to turn off their groundwater pumps and let groundwater basins recover while they're using their surface water supplies so that in the next drought, when they need uh, to use groundwater more and surface supplies are less available, they can switch and rely more on groundwater. So there are three reservoirs on the San Inez River, uh, starting from east to west Jameson Reservoir, which serves Montecito Water District, Gibraltar Reservoir, which serves the city of Santa Barbara, and Lake Kachuma, which serves five different uh, purveyors. All three of those reservoirs on the San Inez River filled up and will be providing water supply for the next few years. On top of that, uh, groundwater basins, which do take longer to fill up and recharge. We have started to see groundwater levels come up after this wet year. And we'd like to see a few more wet years to really start, really bring these groundwater basins back into uh, a more full capacity. So conservation is always a priority here in Santa Barbara County and in California in general. The, the state has a saying that water conservation is a California way of life. And so even during years like this, when we've had you know, a lot of rainfall and reservoirs are full, we can flip to drought conditions in a, in a hurry. We saw the reservoir full in 2011 at Lake Kachuma, and within two years we were back in a very heavy, one of the worst droughts we've ever had. The last 10 years prior to this year were the driest 10-year period in Santa Barbara County history in more than 100 years of record, and so we're very aware that we can always flip to extremely dry conditions. So we're always uh, encouraging water conservation through wet years and dry years in the home, in businesses, uh, in schools and institutions, and folks can, can learn about how to conserve water at our waterwisesb.org website. Uh, there's a lot of information on plants to plant, ways to improve your irrigation, uh, ways to improve water use in your home or in your business, and it'll save you money and save water for the future of dry years. Thank you, Matt, very informative. And for any other questions or information about our water supply or water conservation, go to waterwisesb.org. Next up, Kathy Pere, our resident water expert. She's got some interesting information about drip irrigation that you may not know about. Hi, I'm Kathy Pere with the City of Santa Barbara's Water Conservation Program. Today, we're gonna to talk about trees that most beautiful plant that is so valuable for our plants, our animals, our shade. It's a wonderful resource. We're gonna to talk today about how to efficiently water them all the way from do-it-yourself projects to what a professional might do to assist you. Let's take a peek at all the parts that are necessary. There's a few parts that are necessary to put together an inline drip system. I'm gonna come down, let's show you the most important. We'll start from where the water supply comes in. The water supply is going to come in, your hose is going to hook in, you're going to require a pressure regulator. It can look like this, it'll usually reduce it to 20, 25 or 30 psi. You're going to put a filter system on, this is going to remove any sediment that might be coming from the hose. There's 
a connector. It's just a thread that allows you to hook up drip tubing to it. Uh, it's inline drip. If you look down on the actual tubing itself, you can see some minor little holes and some thickness here. So every 12 inches on this tubing, I have a one gallon per hour emitter. I also have this tool out here. This is a soil probe. And the soil probe is going to allow me to actually take a soil sample. These little holes are every two inches. So I can take a soil sample maybe 12 inches deep and find out at the deepest point, is the soil still moist down there? So we're going to talk about uh, what's the proper type of tubings, where to place it, and then a little bit about how long to water for your individual trees. It really depends on the type of tree. Sometimes you may actually need to ask a professional, ask an arborist to come by and give you a little bit more information about that tree. It's really important for us to try and provide the water and the nutrients that they need to continue to add value and beauty and shade and habitat in our environments and in our landscapes. We've got all our parts. Let's go mark the tree canopy and put this together. Well, we're over here at the water supply. The first thing I'm thinking about is doing the last little finishing connections to the tubing. I'm gonna put a T onto my drip tube so that I can make a circle around the tree. So we're gonna cut a hole, cut the pipe. Just using pruning shears works pretty well. Connect it up. Takes a little jiggling to kind of work these together and get them locked in. I'm gonna connect a T to this so that as I go around the tree off of one side, the tubing can come all the way back into here. So it'll get water going in, it'll fill the tubing, it'll water all the way around. So we've got ourselves connected here. The next step is to figure out exactly where the drip line is. I like to mark it with flags so that when I'm laying my tubing out, I know that I'm in that prime zone where the plant's going to absorb the water. So with this particular tree, it's easy to see that as the rain is going to fall, it's going to hit these outside branches and it's going to fall directly down. So I would come out and come here and I put my little flag. You don't have to put the line exactly where your flags are because those absorptive roots where the moisture and the nutrients are most beneficial for the plant are within a couple of feet inside the drip line and a couple of feet outside the drip line. So the next step we're going to do is we're going to lay that pipe out put some little tacks to hold it in place, and then hook it up to the water. So now we're gonna use these, they're called stakes, soil stakes. They're gonna help hold the pipe down so it doesn't snake away on you. So the easy thing is to do now is we're going to add a T so we can connect up to our water supply. So. We detach the extra piece of pipe. We have our T that's hooked up to what we're going to hook to the hose or to our valve. Take one side of this, give it a wiggle and a little bit of push. It's connected. We connect the other side. So we're going to hook this up to a hose. This is going to be our water supply today. We're already set up with our pressure regulator and our filter, which are really necessary to make sure that the drip or the inline or the soaker tubing uh, doesn't put too much water out over time. You can use your meter and if you check our website, there is a video as well as some flyers on how to read your meter just for this application. All right, we're hooked up. Let's turn it on. Today we're using a hose spigot for our water supply. You can hook this up to a valve in your irrigation system so that you can time it automatically if you want. Doesn't matter. So let's give this just a little bit of water. You don't want to crank it on. You just want to turn it on maybe an eighth to a quarter of a turn. Take a look at your drip zone. And what you should see is little drips coming out of each of those little emitter tubes, the ones that were every 12 to 18 inches apart. Well, we've finished with our drip line connection. So now I'm going to show you a super easy way, do it yourself, that you can use the water that you collect in your shower or in your dish pan to use that to water your tree deep and slowly. In order to make a slow trickle bucket, you need a bucket. And what we're going to do is we're going to drill four little holes so that when we put the water in the bucket, 
and set it down in the mulch, mulch around it, the water's slowly gonna saturate as it's absorbed into the soil. So we've got our holes, our bucket's prepared. That's all there is to it in this part. We're gonna make a little space down here so we can get to the soil, put the mulch around the bucket. We'll place our bucket in contact with the earth underneath, put some mulch around it. We're keeping any evaporation from happening here and allowing it to really slowly soak in. Then we have our bucket from my shower water and we just add it. Perfect do-it-yourself deep soaker for your tree. For those of you who maybe have seen one of these devices used by an arborist or by city staff out with the trees, this is a deep watering soil probe. It's not something that most people regularly do, but if you have some trees that are distressed, if you see the city workers putting, uh, using this soil probe out on our street trees or in the parks, we're doing that for the health of the trees. Trees are such a wonderful investment. They give a place for the kids to play and the wildlife to be at. We really want to continue doing all we can to keep them healthy. For more information on how to water your trees effectively, visit waterwisesb.org. Thank you, Kathy Perret. We got inline irrigation and we also found out that having a hole in a bucket can actually make it more useful. We'll be right back after this break. Rain or shine, water conservation is a way of life in Santa Barbara. Take water conservation to the next level. By replacing your water thirsty lawn with water wise plants, you can enjoy a colorful, low maintenance garden with more flowers and make use of rainwater by turning runoff into a resource. The city provides incentives to encourage water efficient landscapes. Apply for a rebate now. Easy on the eyes, water wise. SB Connect helps you connect with the city to build a stronger community. It's an easy way to report things that need repair or attention around town, like potholes, sidewalk cracks, graffiti, and code enforcement issues. For emergencies, always dial 911. But for less urgent issues, just point your phone, snap a picture or short video, type a description, and click Submit. You can submit service requests anonymously or create a free account to track progress and see how and why other community members are engaging with the city. Visit santabarbaraca.gov forward slash SB Connect to download the app. Welcome back. You know, in our community, people are giving up on the siren song of the perfect lawn. If you're tired of what's going on in your front yard and you want to make some changes, find some alternatives, stay tuned. I'll get your creative juices going and also show you how to save money and save water. Hi, let's talk about lawns, especially front lawns, front gardens. A um, little back history. When I was a kid, I was raised in New York in the city. Didn't know what a lawn was, only my cousin had a lawn out in, uh, in Long Island. We moved to California, my folks brought me with them, and we were in the suburbs and we had a lawn. So the street was for sports, playing baseball and football, and the lawn was like our, uh, uh, our aquatic center. Uh, water balloons running through the sprinklers, slip and slide, all that sort of thing. Also pushing a mower around. These days, I don't see kids on front lawns. I don't know, it might be different in your neighborhood, but they're in the house doing something else or they're at a sports field or something like that. The good news, lawns are gradually disappearing from our neighborhoods, whether it's motivated by cost, saving money on water and gardening, or environmental, uh, not using all the lawn chemicals or having polluting gas mowers running around. It's still a good thing. What if you could have a beautiful, useful, sustainable front yard that also offers curb appeal and maybe even gives you an opportunity to spend more time in your front yard or greeting your neighbors. I've got a lot of information, so stay tuned. So this is a project I did for a really great family, husband, wife, two kids, um, and what's behind me right now uh, used to be just kind of a continuously sloping 
corpse of a lawn. There was nothing much living, even the weeds seemed a little bit stressed. Gophers were happy though. And we had to make some decisions as to what the front garden was gonna be and who is it for? Sounds like a simple question, but there's a few ways to go. Uh, you can go for curb appeal, where the whole garden is designed from how it looks from the street. And that's sort of a wedge. You put all the uh, big stuff in the background and smaller stuff, and then it tapers off. So everything looks nice from this view. Another alternative is the uh, it's all mine kind of approach where you wall everything off or you put a hedge around the garden and it's all about what you've got in here. Uh, if you do take that approach, that's fine, but be sure to check with zoning ordinances. There's limitations sometimes on how tall a hedge can be or how tall a wall can be in your front yard area. The third is kind of my favorite. I call it a hybrid where you're giving a little bit to the street so you're presentable and the rest of it is something you see from inside the house and that's the hybrid view. So let's get a little further into that and we'll talk about some other ideas. In any design at the early stage, call it a bubble diagram or a conceptual design, uh, I work with four different elements just to kind of map out the space. So uh, go through this exercise. First thing is some sort of symbol that represents a room or a space that you're gonna use, whether it's a lounging area or a breakfast table or a vegetable garden. It's a thing, it has its own use. The next is circulation. How do I get from point A to point B? Typical lot like this, you want to get people from the street to your front door, but you also might need a path or something to get you from the car into the house. Third thing is screening, and that can be constructed or it can be grown, and maybe your screening doesn't need to be that high if all you want to do is block a low view. So that's another symbol we use. And the last one is a focal point. And that can be anything from a statue or a fountain or a bird bath uh, to the high point of your planting, some specimen tree or a really nice flower combination. Look for opportunities, if they're available in your front yard, to capture rainwater from the roof and detain it or allow it to sink in in your garden. We live in an impermeable world where everything runs off and a lot of what comes off our gardens just ends up going in the gutter, going out to the creeks and carrying a bunch of stuff with it we don't need. So creating a swale um, or a uh, simulated rock creek sort of effect is a really good way to create something that's interesting to look at and also serves an environmental benefit. A little bit of design jargon. Behind me is what you might call an egress tree. When I first learned about that in, uh, in my first design class, I thought he was talking about a long-legged white wading bird in the marsh, but egress just means what you see as you look out. A lot of homes are lined up so that when you open the front door and you look out, you see the street, you see parked cars, you see traffic. I think it's much nicer if you can pull it off to have something attractive to look at that softens your view to the street and gives you a little bit of separation. In this case, it is a uh, cone bush or a safari sunset. Beautiful plant. Think about the level of security or separation uh, that you'd like to have uh, between the street and the house. In this case, a post and rail fence was all we wanted. It's a suggestion that this is out there and this is in here, but it's not something you can lock and secure your entire house. For some people, that is a concern. If you are going that route, also balance that with being able to see your front door and how secure you feel walking into your, your home at night or in the dark. Uh, and for that, we've also got lighting that helps with a lot of other things. So think about fencing or some sort of divider. Might even be a nice archway with a vine over it. Uh, but this is the place where we go from out there to in here. Let's think about path materials. Uh, certainly we want something that's attractive and this uh, flagstone here is just a beautiful selection. Got very lucky when, when this was found at the, uh, at the stone yard. Um, decisions about changing elevation, it might seem simpler and it probably is to just slope, but I like the idea of stepping up a little bit to create a separation between the outside area and the inside area. Unless you need to be moving something on a cart or whatever, in this case we can just bring it in from the driveway. Uh, something else, when you do have an elevation change, uh, having some light so you can see the step coming is a good idea. Uh, another thing is traction. 
Um, when we get some wet weather, a stone like this has got some nice uh, grip to it, whereas things like um, glazed tile or that sort of thing can be very dangerous, especially when they're wet and slippery. So think about the selection of materials, not only aesthetic, but practical. Another consideration is how do we get uh, curbside parking? Our guests are arriving, uh, maybe they've got a hot casserole or whatever and they have to get to the front door. I want to be able to open the door, step out onto a predictable, safe, level surface. Not a parkway where the elevation has dropped or there's a bunch of plants. I have to get a machete or a flamethrower to get through here. So be gracious, uh, be considerate, and uh, it'll also keep your plants from getting stomped on. So double win here. Now comes the fun part, the plants. Uh, it's easy to go to the nursery and just buy everything that gets you excited. Uh, for front yards, I tend to encourage simplicity. You're often designing for somebody who's viewing it from across the street or driving by. Um, and uh, a complex type just doesn't register, it turns into a blur. So using a few types of plants, using them in a bold way is a lot better way to uh, to be visible from the street. Certainly we're gonna choose plants that are low water using, uh, that don't require a lot of maintenance. And the real key to low maintenance is getting the spacing right. All of these plants look really cute when they're in little one gallon containers, but they grow up to be, uh, to be big kids. So knowing that uh, this lomandra is gonna get five feet across and giving it that much room in the bed, very important. Otherwise you spend all your time breaking up fights pruning things, changing their character. So we're looking for low water, low maintenance, and definitely proper spacing. So where are you gonna find all these beautiful uh, plants to bring home to your garden? Uh, a really great resource, and one that I've covered in past episodes, is waterwisesb.org. And if you go to the landscape menu, and you go to virtual plant tour, you'll see uh, a couple of really fabulous resources. One of them is a tour of different homes, so you can see how plants are used. And another is a gallery of different uses. So there'll be a section that says front yards, or slopes, or native plants. So do explore that, spend some time. You might find some great candidates that work with your garden as well. That's all I got for you. Uh, I hope that this talk about front yards has given you some inspiration, maybe a little curiosity. Something you might do to get rolling is spend a little time, take a walk through your neighborhood, see what other people are doing with their front gardens. It's good to do in your own neighborhood because a lot of the houses are similar, so you might get some ideas from that. Uh, in the meantime, our objective, make it beautiful, make it useful, make it sustainable. See you on the next one. So what do you think? Any of those ideas resonate for you? If so, spend a little time in your front yard, walk around your neighborhood, see what other people are doing, and see where it takes you. But if that's too ambitious, what about creating small seasonal pockets of color that look great year round? I'm going to Terrasol Garden Center. Follow me, and I'll give you some great ideas. When I'm working with a new client, one of the top requests is often, I want a lot of color. And by that, they usually mean a lot of flowers. Well, I don't have Martha Stewart's budget. They don't have Martha Stewart's budget or staff. So there's got to be some way of making it work, but on a manageable level. I call that pockets of color. And it doesn't have to do with loading your, uh, your pants with uh, confetti. There's another way around it. Three big points. Be strategic with where you put the new flowers. Be minimalist, just pick your battles. And the last one is to try to be seasonal. So this is an excuse for going back to the nursery a few times a year, picking out a few things that are really gonna pop, figuring out where to put them that you'll get the most effect from them, and to keep it simple. Then when they're not doing their best anymore, it's okay to just take a few plants out, run off to the nursery, drop a few more in. Year-round color. We're thinking strategically, where are people gonna see and appreciate the colors? Certainly at the beginning of a path or at some steps where uh, guests and you see that arrival, people driving by get some curb appeal. Great places to start, like right at the beginning of the journey. Hold that thought. Second strategic spot that might be useful is along a pathway. One of the reasons is that people are moving slowly 
along a path so you can get a little bit more complex in your composition. In this case, I've got a few semi-permanent uh, perennials. We've got society garlic and back behind this beard tongue, but there's little pockets here where a few extra flowers are gonna make a big impact and make sure that when these are all done, there's still something flowering down below. One more. Probably one of the most obvious places for a splash of seasonal color is gonna be at the front door. Um, if you've got a paved porch, that means flower pots. You could pull it off with colorful pillows. They don't take nearly as much water. Um, but if you want flowers and, and pretty things like that, give this a shot. Also, uh, this is not just a front yard thing in the back at, off your patio where you can see things from your back doors. That's another great strategic place to put big pops of seasonal color that you can just take out once in a while, refresh, and you're off to the races again. You've walked around your garden, you've figured out some strategic places where you wanna create some nice seasonal pockets of color in between existing plants. Um, so you're gonna to go to the nursery, but before you whip out your, uh, your credit card, there's some things to think about. Think about the environment you're planting in, meaning is it sunny, is it shady? Those are two of the most important criteria for plant selection, what's gonna grow where, because we want the plants to thrive. Even though they might only be short-term guests, we want them to do their best and stay healthy. So look at the sunlight, the shade, um, the type of soil that you have. Since these might be short-lived, it's not quite as important. Um, I recommend anywhere I'm putting some new plants to work at least a little bit of planting mix or compost into the soil. Uh, maybe even the day before, give it a deep soak so that the water uh, sinks out, but there's a nice reservoir down below that'll help get your plant started. So now it's uh, time to express your taste, your personal flair. So we'll talk a little bit about color, we'll talk a little bit about form and shape. Um, first thing, color scheme. Uh, I think this is one of the greatest, least expensive tools to turn somebody into a great designer. This is an artist color wheel. You can find them at art supply stores around town. Uh, if that doesn't work, pick them up. Um, online. Uh, the back side is, I find, really helpful. So just to explain, think just in general terms. Do I want warm colors? This is going to be based on what's already there, uh, maybe the colors of your house or some of the accessories, but we could do a warm color scheme, which is great for pop. Adds a lot of light, things jump out, they're visible from a distance. Alternately, this is going to be very technical, cool colors. The blues, the purples, the uh, darker greens, that sort of thing, you can focus on this. It's not one or the other, but it's sort of what's gonna be dominant. Uh, white is also a great addition to bring out the color in anything else. So we're picking our colors first. Another thing to think about is right plant, right place. How much space do you have? Are you looking for a spreading plant that's gonna stay low, a ground cover type thing? Or do you need to drop something in that's not gonna get too wide? Start by reading the labels. That'll give you some information, but they can be very general. So check with somebody who's working at the nursery, see if you can get their firsthand experience. Uh, what we don't want to do is put a plant that wants to turn into a Rottweiler in this space where you've only got a Yorkie. You've heard me use that line before, but it works. So for example, if I just have um, some small spaces, plants like marigolds for warm weather growers are a really great choice. And when they do uh, start running out of steam, you can just pop the heads off, new flowers come. Um, I could see a six pack like this being spread out uh, at least a foot from each other and cover a decent amount of space with a nice pop to it. Um, if you want a little bit more spread, something that'll grow more as a ground cover, staying with our warm colors, things like gazania daisies are essentially ground covers, and some of these plants could stay in permanently. You may decide that if you found the right plant, right place, and they're well adjusted to your site, you may not need to refresh these all the time, um, but these are certainly plants that will uh, give you a nice pop of color. Need something vertical, small space. Uh, this plant is called Angelonia. I thought it was a uh, cold cut I would get at the Italian deli, but no, it's a plant. Um, it's a perennial, but it's also a plant that will put on a really big show very quickly. And if you want to sustain them and keep them going for a while, I suggest going in with a little snipper and taking out an occasional branch, cutting it back hard. That'll hit the restart button and that little stub that you left is going to grow more flowers. These can, these can be the gift that keeps on giving from early spring, uh, probably into late fall. And if they overwinter, that's great too. 
What I'm doing here is I'm using two soft pastel colors to create a little more variety. You can think about how loud or busy you want the color scheme to be or how simple you want. What I like about this is I've got subtle color variations on the same shape and the same form. So there's some uh, continuity or cohesion between the two plants, but I'm still getting a little bit of color. Want to amp that up a little bit more? Just the thing. I just spotted these um, alyssum. So we've got a very similar flower form um, and we've got the purple, but we've also got a splash of white that's gonna brighten it up. So this is a very cool kind of cottagey type of look as opposed to like hot and in your face. Want some drama? Try these guys, strong vertical lines, uh, nice sort of skyrocketing flowers. This is Gumfrena, say that quickly three times. This is a form of salvia. Uh, this can become a more permanent shrub and uh, this is a little bit more short-lived. I'm not here for the specifics, just so much as to give you an idea of shape and form. So I've got our tall verticals in here, and again, kind of a nice harmonious color scheme with a little bit more differentiation. And if I wanna amp that up a little bit, here's a uh, perennial that needs a little bit of cutting back once in a while, but this will pop with some beautiful golden yellow flowers, and it's this bright gray uh, glaucus foliage that's really gonna add some punch to a combination like this. Again, read up on the size, see how big it's gonna get. This is a big guy. These guys aren't gonna take up too much space. One situation a lot of people have, if you're a bulb lover, you know that bulbs grow, they do their thing, usually in the winter or spring. Uh, we give them some time to sort of harden off and store some energy for next year. And then often the foliage disappears, you're left with a bald spot. That's the time to move in with this strategy and start bringing in some of the other plants. So as a bulb cover, this uh, seasonal pockets of color uh, are a really good way to go. Got a full shade area and don't need flower color. That's where coleus comes in. And there are hundreds of varieties of them. I'll be honest with you, I haven't had any long-term success with these. So this is a plant that you pinch back frequently. And when it finally gets leggy and grown out, uh, that's the time to trade out. But there's so many amazing foliage colors. Uh, who needs flowers when you've got something like this to play with? That's what I've got regarding uh, adding pockets of color, seasonally adjusted, so there's always something fresh in your garden. Put on a little show, do it on a budget, and uh, not an awful lot of work, so try your pockets of color. So if you're like me, any excuse for going to a nursery and picking up some colorful plants is a fabulous thing. So thanks to Terrasol Garden Center, Mike Tully and all the crew there for letting us in. Well, that does it for this episode. I uh, hope you've learned something you can use in your own garden. Uh, all the episodes are available at waterwisesb.org. And for now, that's it. I'm still Billy Goodnick, and we'll see you at the next one.